Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's Specifying Practice Group call. Uh, today's session is recorded, as with all of our practice group sessions, and will be posted to the CSI YouTube channel later today or early tomorrow. And it can be found at youtube.com forward slash CSI construction. Uh, with that, I do want to hand it over to today's co-chairs, Dave Stutzman and Lewis Medcalf, to get started with today's topic on Division 1, Bridge to Construction. So, Dave and Lewis, over to you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Dave Stutzman coming to you from on the road again. I am trying to torture Lewis and see how many di uh, times I can actually do this in a year, make him <laughs> drive the program. Uh, but coming to you from uh, northern New Jersey, attending the AIA uh, Expo that, that they have here. So if you're hearing background noise, it's only the other exhibitors setting up as we're getting ready for the show. So, Lewis, over to you. Hi, well, I'm coming to you from uh, sunny downtown Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm looking forward to uh, learning a lot about Division I from that uh, great guru of specifications, the man who has done for specifications what... Uh, uh, Careful. <laughs> All right, uh, we won't do that one this month. I'll do that one another time. <laughs> okay, so take it away, David. Okay. Well, why are we talking I, about Division One this this month? Well, for a couple of reasons. I've I've had some recent experiences where we're trying to start the specifications and we're trying to find out uh, what is the project delivery method on this project exactly. Oh, you don't know. Well, and how am I supposed to write Division One? <laughs> so you would you would think that as they're halfway through CD phase that they might have a clue as to how they're going to deliver the project, but no, we ran into that one. Uh, we've also run into issues where the architects are gladly giving Division One away to the CM for them to write. Oh yes, I've, I've run into that where they tried to insist on doing that actually. So I, I thought... Them. I usually uh, fend off such blandishments. So I, I figured it was time to talk about Division One a little bit anyhow. And, and it really started because I'm trying to coordinate a, a current project, Division One, with a, an owner's um, custom conditions economy. Well, we're not going to talk about that today because that could be absolutely anything. I want to do look more at the traditional AIA conditions of contract and how they may affect Division One, and what sorts of we might need to ask to even be able to begin to specify Division One. All right. So that go ahead. Good. So when I went and looked at uh, the basic elements of trying to write Division One conditions of contract. They're thinking in terms of AIA or EG CDC, and really this presentation is all written around AIA because I rarely am involved in EJ CDC documents. But the conditions are really defining the duties and responsibilities, the duties of the owner, the architect, and the contractor. Oops, I said that in the wrong order. According to AIA, it's the owner, the contractor, and yes, the architect gets the third billing. Uh, the, well, the contract uh, is between the owner and the contractor. True, but ask an architect which billing they should get. <laughs> Number one? Okay. The Division One documents then as administrative procedures and the specifications as the technical requirements. So looking at the broad headings of the conditions of contract being duties and responsibilities. Division one as administrative procedures as to how you implement those duties and responsibilities. And then the technical requirements and the specifications about how those all apply to individual systems, materials, products, and such. So we might think about the conditions of the contract as establishing basic strategic requirements such as thou shalt have submittals and thou shalt not do any work until they are approved. Division one tells the contractor how to make those submittals. Are they paper? Are they going to be uh, 
submitted electronically and so forth. And so the, the tactical, the tactical attraction. Tactical, the tactical. Okay. And then the specifications say, oh, well, for this particular product, I want to see product data and shop drawings, but I don't need samples. Right. And I think that pretty much sums it up. So Division One is really forming the bridge between the conditions of contract and the specifications, uh, hence the title of the um, presentation for Oops. today. I'm sorry. What happened? You're going to be fired as the driver. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> OK. So going through AIA 201, and looking at the responsibilities that the document is setting, it's, it's really pretty broad uh, requirements that it addresses. And you see by the list, it's, it's very high um, elements of the work. You know, it's the, the construction by the owner. What is the owner actually going to be responsible for, if anything? You know, how do you manage the changes in the work? Uh, and we all know that the work never changes once the contract is signed, so that's probably relatively unimportant. <laughs> but the and probably the one most near and dear to the contractor's heart is how does he deal with payments and what should he be able to expect? And of course, the um, the progress and the completion, the scheduling, the logistics that the contractor has to work out and the final completion tests and inspections to get to the quality assurance of the project. You know, so those are all pretty broad implications, the responsibilities set out by the conditions. And of course, the substantial completion has some very significant legal implications because that's the date on which the statute of repose starts to run for the contractor's uh, warranty. Right, that and so much every everything really shifts to the owner for the responsibility for the completed construction. Yes, insurance coverage and all kinds of uh, legal stuff. Right. Okay, but the conditions also set out some specific duties for the parties to the contract and to the architect. So you want to go to the next one, Les? There we go. Okay, so Lewis, I'm going to leave the architect duties to you because I know that you'll be able to explain those well. But the duties assigned to the owner, really, the owner has to set out the services that he's provided. Uh, he's obligated, for instance, to provide a site survey that the contractor can use to be able to lay out the work. You know, he's, a, he's assigned the duty or the right to be able to stop the work for whatever reason the owner might deem appropriate. And the owner can always take back part of the work and carry out the work that he believes needs to be done or the work that he believes the contractor is not performing, at least not in accordance with the uh, contract. And lastly, if the owner is providing materials for the contractor to install, he has to provide the submittals. He has to provide enough data to the contractor so that the contractor knows exactly what he's getting from the owner or from the supplier uh, for the eventual inst installation. Hey, Lewis, tell us a little bit about the architect's duties. Well, of course, the, the chief thing is, uh, is contract administration. Um, once construction starts, the paper work starts originating with the contractor and the architect engineer is in a reactive mode because the, the, the contractor is going to start sending in the paper and whether it's uh, submittals or RFIs or change order requests or uh, other issues, we react to those. And uh, one of the things th that benefit the contractor is having a professional handle this stuff rather than the owner because many uh, owner project managers are not trained professionals they're not familiar with the the uh, normal construction procedures in in the US and and so 
there would be a steep learning curve as well as the fact that the architects to a certain extent, even though they get paid by the owner, are somewhat independent because of the uh, licensure and registration. Um, the communications with the owner have to go through uh, the architect because uh, the architect needs to know what's going on and the, one of the scary things that happens with to us from time to time is when the owner and the contractor get together and start making decisions without letting us know until they are fit to complete an accomplished fact. And of course uh, uh, getting out in the field and making sure that if the contractor is claiming that the roof is 20 percent done on the schedule of values that uh, and is claiming for that payment and we see that he's only put down a couple of hundred square feet and it's not in very good condition then we uh, say no we're not going to approve that for payment and then of course conducting the inspections to at the end of the contract for close out and uh, working with the uh, punch lists and and, uh, and so forth and responding to questions that the contractor may have about ambiguities or missing information from that are in the contract documents. And I wanted to be sure that we got the right word in there, the completion inspections. Those, yeah. those are the only two times the architect actually performs an inspection, substantial completion and final completion. Yes, all the other uh, activities on site <clears throat> looking at the construction underway are referred to as observations and there is an important legal distinction in those words that uh, has liability implications. Okay, so we skipped the contractor, maybe the most important one in the discussion to some degree, uh, but the contractors required uh, to provide construction schedules and of course the construction schedules are really for the contractors benefit it be it's set up as though it's an informational uh, submittal for the architect and owners review but this the schedule is what controls the logistics of the entire construction process start to finish and also serves as a as the measure of the completion of the work as you're going along to track whether or not he's actually on schedule behind, falling behind schedule what he might need to do to be able to make up the schedule and and, and, and I have nothing but awestruck admiration for a a good contractor or CM who is adept at that scheduling the thoughts of handling dozens of subcontractors with complicated insulation requirements that dependencies and who needs to get there first and not crowding the site with too many people uh, have, that's an astoundingly complex task that I admire when it's done right and that's one of the factors that makes a difference between a really good contractor and uh, a not so good contractor is how well they can schedule the work. Yep. So then he's also responsible for all of the record documents and samples. Those are all of the really the markups as he's going through construction based upon the original construction contract documents that the architect has issued. He is absolutely required to maintain those sets of documents on site and to be able to keep them current. And we might include the uh, construction photographs in that also. Yes, but documents and samples are the ones specifically mentioned in the contract. So maybe the photographs would be something that gets mentioned in Division 1. That's true. It's not in the general conditions, is it? No, it's not. So well, what do you expect from a 100-year-old document? <laughs> At least he didn't ask for daguerreotype, so um, we're good. <laughs> All right. So, so he's also required to uh, provide shop drawings, product data, and samples. And this is sort of an important distinction because those are the only submittals that are actually mentioned 
in the conditions of contract. And those are the same submittals that uh, AIA master spec uh, identifies as action submittals. So those are the ones that contractors are to contractors obligated to submit. And then finally, the site usage, coordination, and cleaning up. It's really managing the logistics of the site, the use of the site, and all of the subcontractors. Uh, David Metzger reminds us that one of the more important things uh, that the contractor is solely responsible for is job site safety. As yes, well he is. As, as well as means and methods. Yes. And thank you, Dave, because I, I did not include that in this list because that really does not have a direct implication for Division One. but you're absolutely right. Okay, so Lewis, how does yes. all this mesh with Division One? We talked about responsibilities, talked about some of these duties assigned by the conditions. Well, how does this fit? <laughs> The whole point is to try <clears throat> try to set up the uh, uh, procedures for accomplishing all of these tasks that uh, we're going to require uh, this construction schedule, for example, to be submitted before the first application of, for payment. We're going to have other requirements about how shop drawings and product data are submitted. Are, are they going to be submitted by paper? Or are they going to be submitted electronically? Okay, but I, th I think we have a method of showing how this can get to be pretty confusing here, don't we? Like this? Something like that. So, <laughs> Shall I put the rest of the spaghetti up? <laughs> Certainly. Okay, Lewis insisted on using color because it was even way more confusing when I had it simply the single blue color. So what, what we're trying to show is that there's a, a direct relationship between these responsibilities and these duties that are assigned by the conditions of contract and the kinds of things that we're typically writing in Division One. So let's let's go to the next one, Lewis, and let's explore this maybe in a little bit more detail. Sure, the, and of course this is the the whole concept that um, that you uh, mentioned that we're uh, trying to have this. The Division One is the bridge between the kind of the theory and practice, so to speak. Okay, you need to back up just one. Okay, somehow sorry. you skipped. There we go. Sorry. There we go. So, yeah, the responsibilities are really being spread out through throughout Division One, and you can see, like the construction by owner, typically it's being specified in the summary section of Division One. What is the owner providing? What what is he providing that the contractors to install? Is the owner furnishing separate contracts, or is he pre-purchasing items and then assigning it to the contractor? So, Lewis, why don't you explain some of the other ones here? <laughs> okay. I'm going to put you on the hook, especially since you didn't have anything to do with putting this together. Except the pretty colors. Yes, you did. Well, um, of course, uh, the owner blesses, owners, bless their hearts, are always going to want some changes during the construction. But uh, if sometimes the contractor is going to propose changes and uh, the owner, of course, has to sign off of them and, and say, yeah, that's okay, or no, it's not. Um, the owner has to sign the check, but they're going to do, it's going to do that on the basis of recommendations from the AE having gone to the site and say that a certain amount of work has been done, that the contractor doesn't appear to be front-end loading the, the uh, the payments schedule is getting the payments ahead of the actual work, so to speak. Um, yep. And interesting too that I'm substitutions having... fall into that same category as price and payment and uh, changes in the work, because yes. literally when you're um, 
approving a substitution, you're actually approving a change in the contract. Yes, which is why, uh, of course, uh, architects are not allowed to make the change unilaterally. They have to, if it affects, especially if it affects contract sum or contract time, we have to get the owner's buy-in to be able to do that. And, and then f the uh, completion inspections are all specified as part of execution and closeout requirements within Division One, And this is where we're going to set up the procedures for the architect and the contractor as to what is a contractor going to be required to do to, to show that he is at substantial completion. How many times might the architect actually come back and re-inspect when he discovers it's really not substantially complete? And what happens if he does have to come back and reinspect? Yeah, who's going to pay for that extra service? Uh, incidentally, David, a few years, some years ago, when I was working in my previous firm, we had a fellow in in our office who was uh, uh, from Sydney, Australia. And uh, one day he asked me, he says, he "says What's a punch list?" And when I explained to him what it, what it was, he said, oh, you mean a defects list. Uh -huh. That's calling a spade a spade. <laughs> well, perhaps, except it also could be incomplete work as opposed to just maybe defective work. <laughs> and um, Kevin, well, that's still a defect, though. If it's incomplete, that's defective. <laughs> Kevin O'Baron points out that substitutions uh, under the A201, true substitutions are approved only by saying, signing a change order. Again, that, that reinforces the concept that once the contract's been signed and the, the owner and the, the, and the contract says you're going to have a certain type of roofing, and if the, the owner and the contractor decide that they can live with a cheaper uh, brand of roofing or a more expensive one, then uh, they have to sign a change order, both of them agreeing to that change. The architect and the contractor can't get together and do that by themselves. Neither can the owner and the contractor do that without the architect's agreement because they might agree to something that would have some technical issues. So all three have to agree on uh, substitutions, changes in work. Correct. Okay, so let's go to looking at some of the duties and how those get distributed in Division 1. So you'll have to go, f you're going to have to go forward again a couple times because somehow or other you got out of order. There you go. Oh, oh okay. One too far. That guy? I think oh. we're, going to, we're going to have to do a driving test. Is that what you want? I'm sorry, David. That's all right. Okay, I wanted to show the duties in relationship to Division One. Oh, all right. Okay. There should be a view there to show that. There you go. Like that. Yes, there you go. Okay, so you can see that in this case, the duties assigned to the owner really, virtually all of them relate only to the summary. It's setting up. Uh, the overall uh, project and how it's, the project is going to be approached. The contractor and the architect's duties, though, are more distributed throughout Division I, uh, mainly because of the administration of the contract and the, and the payments and the submittals and such that the contractor is going to have to make. So there's a, a much wider um, breadth to the architect's and contractor's responsibilities, which leads to the point when I had the CM offer to prepare Division One for the architect, and the architect willingly gave the CM the uh, responsibility for preparing Division One. What I tried to warn the architect about is, remember, the now you've allowed the contractor to define your administrative 
requirements, your administrative duties under the construction contract. And the and scope if, of work. Correct. And if, and if it's not in agreement with your own contract, because it's part of the construction contract, you will still be obligated because the contractor has the, the right to rely on the duties that are assigned. So it can mean opening up an entire new scope of work for the architect if he's going to give up control of Division One, Or he's going to have to spend some time carefully reviewing whatever the contractor has written to ensure that it's consistent with his own contract. Kevin has a uh, rather snarky comment. He says, given all the colored lines at weird angles, I sure hope the specs themselves are more clear than these slides. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> yes, let's hope so. Well, this comes from a, a guy who's uh, high up on the committee that's uh, reorganizing master format. Except that this is going to have to snake back into A201 to get things arranged in the same order, and that's likely not to happen. Okay, so what what I uh, am offering up today for the the remainder of the presentation or the discussion here uh, at Conspectus, we're using two separate forms to try to collect information relating to Division One. And we've, we've boiled this down to five pages. And it, I say five pages, and it, it's not real dense information. Those are the handouts that we're sharing with you today. That I believe that if we can get a good response to these forms, that we have probably 90% of the information that we need, along with the drawings to understand the scope of the job, about 90% of the information we need to actually complete Division 1. There should be very few remaining questions once we get a, these completed forms back to actually sit down and write Division 1. And, it's, it, and I'm completely in agreement with um, David, that this is sometimes difficult to get that kind of information, and so having a set of questions, uh, I myself have a, a similar set of questions to uh, interrogate the project architect or the project manager with, that uh, this can be very helpful, and David's been kind enough to share his, but you can take those and uh, perhaps adapt them to your own practice. Okay, so let's go ahead and just walk through those then, Lewis. Okay. All right, so the first form uh, is really only a two-page form, and I have that listed as 01 Project Summary Report. Uh, what it really is trying to do is collect information on the players, the names, their representatives, their address, contact information, the things that the contractor may need to know to be able to uh, make effective contact uh, with the architect, with the owner, to know who is going to be responsible, who's going to be in charge during the construction. This may not be the principal. It should be, from the architect's office, should be the person that's actually going to be the uh, primary uh, construction administrator. The it, same may sound, it may sound very obvious, but uh, you know, owners get really bent out of shape when they're thumbing through the specs and they see that their name has been misspelled in the header or the footer or whatever, which uh, I have seen happen. I haven't done it, but I have seen it happen. Oh, those of us with fat fingers I, and the typing skills that I have, I, I will admit that I've made those kinds of mistakes. <laughs> The form helps because now I can just copy the data right out of the form and paste it in and if the owner and the architect can't get their own names right, um, shame on them. That's right. Okay, so go ahead on to the next one. So 
looking at the forms, what I've tried to do is organize these, and you can say, see this is 1.4, so the first three items here were really collecting information about the various players. So I've tried to organize it sort of in a fashion, start, start to finish of Division I. The, it doesn't actually occur in 100% linear order, but it's close. So contract information, you know, what, what are the forms that we're actually going to be using? You know, what, are, what will the agreement form be on the project? What will the conditions be? Can we identify them? That, that is something that should be decided before the architect really even starts construction documents. Before that, we should know the type of construction contract and the project delivery method. Because it all affects, those kinds of decisions affect Division One throughout Division One, especially if we're dealing with construction manager as advisor or construction manager as constructor, because the procedures differ. The submittal procedures, the correspondence procedures, the communications procedures all differ, especially if it's ad, as advisor. Yeah, the, one of the major differences in Division One because the the CMA, for example, along with the architect, has to sign off on pay requests and and review submittals, and will do the strategic scheduling. But it is going to it's not going to do any of the work, including uh, temporary facilities um, with its own people. So you have to go through and assign those things. And you might explain for some of the folks who live in, uh, in different parts of the country where they don't have multiple prime contracts for public work projects, uh, just what some of that, how that works out with Division One, David? Well, multiple primes is a real treat and we we are obligated, I know in Pennsylvania and I believe Ohio is also uh, requires multiple primes for uh, public yeah. works projects. That's why I moved to Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> that can't be the entire reason, but okay, it's a good reason because it's <laughs> It certainly complicates the contracts. Uh, Division one uh, for multiple primes actually will begin to require that the specifications assign work to each of the multiple primes. So know who is responsible, where the line of demarcation is, uh, especially for site work. And that would be the traditional five feet outside the building so that you pick up with a site contractor outside of that plumbing and uh, mechanical electrical contractor inside of that line. Uh, but the multiple primes can be anything from a four, four multiple primes which are common, uh, which would be general construction, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. And you can start to see multiple prime including uh, structural steel framing, elevators, uh, it could be any number of things, uh, and depending upon the states and the circumstances. And uh, depending upon the, again, upon the circumstances, when I was practicing in Ohio, um, the state projects, the separate, the multiple prime contracts stayed multiple. They weren't just bid, they were separate contracts, but the city of Cincinnati, which was a home rule city, would allow you to assign the multiple prime bidders to the GC. But uh, Kevin uh, says that Ohio took the teeth out of its separate primes law about five years ago. Of course, I've, I haven't uh, practiced in Ohio since, well, 1995 is when I came here to Tennessee. Um, yeah, a couple of other. New Jersey gave us an option some. I want to say 15 years ago, you could choose to do single prime or multiple prime. Let's all guess which one everyone <laughs> chooses. That's interesting. Well, I've noticed that a lot of, um, uh, it seems to me like a, a number of uh, government agencies are going to some sort of CEM that kind of to um, do an end around and run around 
these onerous requirements. We need to get caught up with some of the comments and uh, questions, uh, David. Sure. Um, Kevin uh, points out that with respect to uh, identifying the players, uh, that AIA form G612 and EJCDC C-050 are very good for documenting the names and having basic provisions governing both Division 00 and Division 1 topics. Um, I would agree with the G612. It's a, it's a good document. It, as I recall, it is not updated to the 2007 AIA documents uh, and it's the, the, the reason I'm not using it generally is that oftentimes we are not writing Division Zero. And the bulk of that document is Division Zero, and it begins to look very onerous when you yes. hand the architect uh, that form to complete. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a scary document. You, whoever you, you deal with, whether it's the owner or if you're a spec consultant and you're dealing with the architect, you need to walk through it personally. Um, we have a different Kevin, Kevin Chauvin, who says, if I am submitting for a pre-bid prior approval of products in an effort to have our products included as an option equal to what is specified, why isn't it called an addition or request for approval instead of substitution? Well, there are two different uh, uh, procedures, Kevin. The procedures for substitutions during um, the bidding procedure are different from those once the contract is signed. Before the contract is signed, um, substitutions or comparable products can be approved by, uh, by unilaterally by the architect by issuing an addendum. Once the contract is signed, though, um, it usually has to be a, um, a change order unless the owner has put in something in the uh, supplementary conditions indicating that as long as there's no change to contract sum or contract tom time, the uh, architect engineer has the authority to make those changes uh, or to approve comparable products by itself. And then, uh, let's see. Uh, Kevin, I'm sorry, Eastman, just a second here. Kevin Easton says uh, New York City also requires some public work to be multiple prime. Ah, uh, Wick's Law. We have and to deal with that in New York, absolutely. Larry Whitlock says my experience has been that many architects do not ask for or receive adequate owner instructions which would include this information before beginning design. So when I ask for it, so when I ask for it when beginning to edit specs during the last three weeks of the CD phase, they cannot provide. They can't come across with it. Ah, yes. Well, we could share war stories. <laughs> yes, we could. Yes, we could. We share your pain, Larry. And uh, all we can say is um, uh, David and I are of the um, mindset to write your specs early and often rather than uh, late, but and we don't always have that choice. Right. Okay, so let's move on to the rest of these forms and see if we can get through these in the remaining time. I think we can. Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay. Gosh, do you think the code information might be important to know before beginning to write the specifications. Absolutely. And um, one of the chief things about that is the uh, uh, is the energy code because there have been every time they reissue the energy code it gets more restrictive whereas the building code tends to be more evolutionary and has the changes uh, for one uh, set from one edition to another are generally not too dramatic. Right. Well, I what the best the best thing that I like to try to find out is make sure that I understand what occupancy class and construction type. 
because this informs so many things about the technical specifications as well as Division I. Uh, and for instance, just yesterday I was trying to finish a door hardware uh, meeting with the architect. We're looking at a door hardware schedule with no ratings shown for any of the doors. We're a week and a half away from issuing for construction. And because I know the construction type, because I know the classification, I can pretty well guess which doors are going to be fire rated. I might get more included than not, but I know that I'll have everything covered that needs to be. So you mentioned sustainable design criteria, and here it is. You know, what are we working to? Are we actually using lead? Are we using something else? What Green sort of? Yep. Yeah, uh, what rating level are we actually using? And now having in a sort of a cusp area with lead, which system are we going to use? Are we using 2009 or V4? I'm sorry. There we go. Okay. The, because the exterior envelope requires most times uh, delegated design, we're trying to find out how the architect is actually going to approach uh, identifying wind design, seismic design, structural loadings. Uh, most jurisdictions that I know of are going to require the load, the load conditions or the design criteria to be shown on the drawings, which is where we're going to like to reference them from the specifications when they're available. But they're not always included. So we try to capture what that design criteria is because it goes through many spec sections and division one and well beyond. And we have to know how likely what uh, seismic zone we're in and and then there's other questions that have to be answered about the class and the factory and the or the importance factor in the design category um, yep. designing a designing a hospital say in uh, Southern California might be quite a bit different from doing a, a one-story uh, convenience store in say Nebraska <laughs> True, and then some sites actually surprise you because we see in eastern Pennsylvania and, and New Jersey some sites that have some pretty high seismic requirements because they managed to build on some really poor soil. Uh, yes, I remember working on a project where the uh, it was an old dump with the uh, and. Uh, we were down, the uh, soil borings were down 60 something feet and they were still running into old tires and shoes and things. Uh, so the building went on piles and it, it's still there. Well, at least didn't turn into an archival dig. No. <laughs> yeah, no, no American Indian bones or anything. All right, so let's move on to the next one. The next, um, view here is showing you the second form uh, labeled O2 Division I Procedures. So this is really about the architect's administration of the contract. So all of the decisions that we need to write Division I to be able to get these kinds of procedures correct. Okay, on to the next one, Lois. Beep. Okay. You see by 1.1, work by the owner, we're really back to the summary again. So this is all kinds of things that you would list in the summary to show what the contractor is going to have to deal with for his coordination purposes. You know, who is the what is the owner actually going to furnish? We have the owner's restrictions on the contractor's work, especially if it's a existing building that you're doing an addition or renovations. Uh, hospital work is always an active hospital and trying to maintain operations within the hospital. What has to be required? Are yeah, there restricted hours? Well, not only restricted hours, but I, 
<coughs> for uh, most projects, I put in some requirements about uh, uh, that workers can't wear T-shirts with uh, insulting or uh, derogatory uh, or vulgar uh, messages on them, and that they are not allowed to have any contact with the owners. Uh, staff or the public that are using the building, that sort of thing. Well, we're hoping that that's all contained in an owner's policy, and we actually would attach that policy as part of the specifications and just reference that. Oh yes, yeah, that's a, that's obviously a better way to do it. But some of our owners don't always think about that. Yep. So yeah, they, but that has to be made as a, a contract document. So. Okay. And contractor submittals, I, I really can't believe I still have this choice there for paper <laughs> submittals, but we still do have some that are requesting paper submittals. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge that I see at the moment for us in defining the submittals procedures is whether or not the project will use a project website or whether we must deal with uh, email as the method to uh, collect all of the uh, submittals requirements. Yes, and we're running into issues where um, our office uses new forma, but occasionally the uh, we get up against a client who has a different software, um, and uh, I'm a new forma fan, so I have to say that most of the competing products are not as user friendly, and we wind up taking uh, it costs a lot more to do the document control and other construction administrative tasks that if you're having to use software that you're not familiar with uh, to do those tasks yeah there and there are a good number of choices out there now as project website and we we virtually see all of them in in the course of a year I think uh, and some are, are more friendly than others, for sure. The next two, allowances and alternates. These are probably the bane of Division One for specifier. You notice the three choices, yes, no, and unknown. Typically, this form comes back checkmarked unknown and requires us to at least draft an allowance and an alternate section waiting for information as to what those may be and hopefully finding out sometime before the bid issue so that we can actually describe them and get everything coordinated. On the other hand, these those two are, <clears throat> well especially alternates, are one of the things that can be written the day that the project goes out to bid that they usually don't work have that much influence on other sections. However, allowances and unit prices are not quite in that category. Yeah, because we're not doing a lot of heavy civil construction, we rarely are seeing unit prices. Uh, occasionally for school projects, for um, publicly bid school projects, but that that's really about the only place. So I haven't even included unit prices. We ran into it from time to time on um, uh, if you have drilled piers or piles, um, that there's a design length, and that way they can adjust the actual cost to the actual amount of deep foundations that are installed. Uh, we have another couple of comments. Um, Richard Freewalt uh, suggests, suggests including an option to clarify the use of informational submittals and related procedures. And um, Richard, I don't see much need to cover that actually in Division One. Um, the subject is covered to a certain extent strategically in the A201, uh, where it says that the architect can designate certain submittals as informational, and in fact, those that can even happen after the fact. Um, I, like many practitioners. Uh, prefer to identify in the individual spec sections which submittals are action and which are informational, but that's more for convenience than anything else. Um, 
Larry Whitlock says, uh, what should an architect do when a city's project manager insists on using general conditions written for DOT projects for the construction of a city hall and public library complex, conditions that do not even list architects' responsibilities? That, that's Are you going to get question. through it? <laughs> that's an interesting question, Larry, and I have run into that, um, especially since so many DOT projects our unit prices and what you wind up is that uh, the there's one unit price and it's for the building but there that's got kind of tongue in cheek but there really are a lot of issues that need to be dealt with and sometimes one of the things that you you have to do is put stuff that would normally be in the general conditions into division 1 uh, we find that often with owner written uh, general conditions that we often have to supplement those and just put the requirements in division one so that we have the uh, those subjects covered okay let's move uh, on to the next one if you will well, I, I, we have a couple more you can uh, do the questions but let's go ahead and show the oh, next okay, sure. panel all right That guy, yep. uh, Dave. Dave oh, Metzger. Too far. Oh, sorry. Dave Metzger says <clears throat> um, historic Russian projects are where we most often have unit prices and allowances, and and that's true. That's a good way to adjust the the squat the scope of work, which may be difficult to determine in advance. Um, Richard Freewalt again says. That's the issue, lots of extra paperwork without much guidance. And, uh, Kevin O'Baron says, I agree with Richard. What is intended by the results of the AE's action on a submittal should be indicated in Division 1. That's true. Um, you do have to set the ground rules as to that, and I stand corrected, or sit corrected, actually. Well, and I'll chime in in respect to independent specifiers and we try not to include that in division one relying either on the architects uh, submittal review stamp or in the case of one that I just learned about this week Leo A. Daly uh, does not any longer use a submittal review stamp they just use a submittal transmittal form interesting <clears throat> interesting well, let's uh, talk about this slide, product selections. Ah, yes. Important distinctions. Uh, what we're trying to find out is how are the products actually going to be named and uh, named, identified. You know, are, are we going to deal with a finished schedule, for instance, on a drawings? Are they are our clients expecting us to name all the products in the spec? If it's a publicly bid job, do we have both? Because they might name a basis of design in the finished schedule and expect the remaining two or three manufacturers and products to be named in the spec. Or is it a separate ID spec book? Which is, for some of our hospitality projects, is often the case. And uh, with publicly uh, bid projects, that really is very critical. Sometimes the the agency will allow you to make uh, some limited things that are closed proprietary specs such as carpet where the, where the aesthetics are really critical uh, but other things like paint obviously have to be open to multiple manufacturers and when the ID folks put the uh, finishes list on their um, on the drawings bless their hearts they seldom identify which ones are closed proprietary specs and which ones are open to comparable manufacturers. All right, and on the allow other allowable products, often, most times when I use these forms, I actually fill the forms out for the architect and send them to them for their concurrence. And the selection I will always make is other products are permitted by substitution request only. B 
because I think it's a much more rigorous process and I think it gives the owner a better end result. And I wait for the architect to tell me that they will consider comparable products that master spec uh, sets up. And again, to for our audience, the comparable products as defined in the master spec division one is where the products do not require a change in the products uh, in the project contract sum or contract time, and therefore the architect can approve unnamed products that are offered during the submittals process by the contractor without having to uh, go through the formality of a change order. Okay, so the next group is more uh, the payment procedures and the coordination is really about um, the architect's administration uh, of the of processing payments, processing things like um, the construction meetings and such and the contractor submittals. What we're trying to do is make sure that we collect enough information that we can properly inform the contractor so he can bid the project correctly. Uh, the, the stored materials becomes an important uh, aspect depending upon whether it's, especially if it's an urban project where there's precious little on-site storage. Uh, so we may be able to permit him to get paid for off-site stored products as long as he can prove that the owner has ownership of the products. Uh, so we go through all this in, in some detail. The, the liquidated damages, again, this is similar to the allowances and the alternates. The architect rarely knows. We usually get this one coming back checkmarked as unknown. The commissioning agent, we always ask, and sometimes this is driven by lead, because if it's comprehensive, or uh, I think they call it enhanced commissioning, uh, the commissioning cannot be by the contractor. It should be by the owner. It could be by a consultant hired by the architect, but cannot be by the contractor. We, we give the option on the project meetings as to who's conducting them. If you read AIA 201, it's actually the contractor's meeting. So it should be held and conducted by the contractor, meaning that they issue the agenda, they issue the meeting minutes. Uh, oftentimes the owners, especially with their custom general conditions, will dictate otherwise. Uh, when I was practicing in Ohio, <clears throat> the uh, state projects required the architect to uh, record the minutes from uh, the OAC meetings. <clears throat> and next we get in the submittal procedures and the kinds of the time frames uh, that the architect is looking for. We're also asking about the architect, whether or not he's going to make his digital files, whether they be AutoCAD or Revit, available to the contractor for his use in creating submittals. Uh, we have selected clients that will actually do that. Most do not. And I don't, I don't know if the, I can't sense if there's a trend to be more, um, make those more available to the contractor or not. Oh, I think so. We're doing it on almost every project, and the contractors are very happy to, to sign the uh, limitation of liability waiver kind of documentation that our E&O you know, uh, uh, carrier insists on, and because um, they're time and money ahead, and they don't mind uh, they don't mind that paperwork. The advantage is just too great for them. All right, let's move on to the last view here, Lewis, and we'll wrap this up because we're right on the hour. Okay. So we'll go through this last one pretty quickly. Oh, wrong way. There you go. So this last one is really about the temporary facilities and the project closeout demonstration and training. So temporary oh, well, facilities. The testing is that the code special inspections, a, a lot of uh, jurisdictions do not allow the contractor to employ special ins testing and inspecting agencies. 
they have to be employed by the owner. Unless it's the municipality where they want everything rolled into the construction contract. <laughs> true, true. So uh, the temporary facilities uh, really comes down to is it a new or existing? If it's existing, can the contractor tap into the existing utilities? Will the owner allow them to do it? Uh, does the architect and the owner actually require a field office? And is an identification sign required? If it is, is it shown someplace? Does a contractor know what he's going to have to provide? Um, the, Richard Freewall points out that the IBC does not allow the contractor to hire the special inspectors, but I think we'll find that some public agencies will do that anyway. They just they can make up their since they're not technically subject to the code and. In some respects, they can make special rules for themselves. Yeah, so on the execution, we're asking about the final property survey, and this really relates to an Alta uh, type uh, property survey that could be filed with the local jurisdiction. Uh, also asking about the substantial final completion inspections, reinspections. How many do you do? None, one, something else? Uh, we need to define that or you could get stuck for a big uh, big surprise at the end of the project. And the one that has me a little bit baffled is on the O&M uh, submissions. Most times we're seeing the architect request only the final submission and that's a bit surprising that the architects and engineers really do not want to spend time reviewing the O&M uh, to make sure it's appropriate for the owner. And I find that, a, yeah, I find that a bit bothersome. Randy Ross asks, where do manufacturer inspections fit in? Generally, I find that they're ending up uh, being specified in the t in the specifications in the technical requirements, uh, rather than Division One. There are some general um, provisions in Division One, but there aren't any real decisions that need to be made to be able to edit Division 1. Basically, uh, Randy, they uh, such reports are uh, either closeout submittals or um, informational submittals and so they're handled like that and along with other general closeout and, and uh, informational submittals. Okay, and the last one I really want to talk about is under demo and training. Basis of design instructor. I have this line here and it confuses everybody that looks at it. Uh, I always am checking the architect as providing the basis of design instructor. If it's a lead project, that's part of the lead requirement that the architect present, in, in essence, present the design criteria from the owner as part of the demonstration and training to be able to train the owner's personnel as to how to operate the building. Uh, but it does present a lot of confusion, it seems, and I'm usually takes a discussion to get past it. Right, we're not doing the actual training, we're just explaining to the uh, owner's uh, facility management staff what the how the building was designed to meet the owner's project requirements. Correct. Correct. So that brings us to the end, Lewis. All right. Another good meeting. We went overboard. Not by much. A little. We have a, little. a very, we have a very right. patient uh, bunch of, of folks and we appreciate everybody. Yes, so thank you very much all for joining us today and for uh, the comments that you made going through the uh, discussion today. It was uh, always great to hear from you. Uh, we did have a question about uh, can they use the handouts in their private practice once they've removed your uh, uh, logo from the header? Absolutely. Feel free. So we don't have a... Uh, uh, David and I have a couple of ideas for next month, but if you've got an idea, keep those cards and letters coming in, friends and neighbors, because we want this to be 
your discussion group and to meet your requirements and your needs and your interests. So uh, we'll look forward to talking to you in June. All right. See you all then. Thank you for joining.